All right, hello everyone. So I wanted to record this video of doing these weak acid strong base titration problems. Um, so this right here is a titration curve of when we titrate a strong base into a solution of weak acid. On the x-axis here is the volume of strong base being added and on the y-axis is the pH. And remember, our goal is to be able to, to, to determine the pH at any point along this curve here. All right. And so we've broken this curve up into four regions. The region before any titrant was added, that's this very first point on the graph right here. We have the equivalence point, which is this midpoint of this vertical region right here. This is our equivalence point. And then we have region two, which is after we have started our titration, but before we've actually reached our equivalence point. So this is region two here. And then lastly, we have the last region here, which is everything after that equivalence point. So that'd be this portion right over here. Okay. And the reason why it's important that we're sort of talking about dividing this curve into these four regions is because we're going to have a slightly different strategy for calculating the pH in each of these different regions. All right, so let's just take them one at a time here. So the first one, before any titrants added. So here's our sample problem. Um, we're going to calculate the pH of 35.00 milliliters of a 0 0.350 molar solution of butanoic acid. So in order to calculate the pH, this is just like calculating the weak, uh, sorry, calculating the pH of a weak acid solution that we talked about in chapter 17, right? So I take some butanoic acid. I make a solution with it, meaning I toss it in water. And I'm going to have this reaction where my conjugate base that forms, right, my acid plays the role of an acid where it loses a proton, becoming the conjugate base. And that proton is donated to water, creating my hydronium ion. And of course, to figure out the pH of this solution, what I'm really interested in is what happens to the concentration of hydronium ion that's formed. Whoops. All right. So we had this first step, balanced chemical equation. And this is for my solution of weak acid, meaning I'm looking at the reaction with H2O, okay? So then step two was to get your Ka expression, your equilibrium expression for this reaction. And remember when we think equilibrium, we think products over reactants. So I'm gonna take my two products. And divide it by the concentration of reactant. All right, and now we just have to be able to fill in each of these terms, right? So for the value of Ka, where can we find that? We have to look at our constants page, okay? And this is butanoic acid, so I'm going to go to my constants page, and I'm going to look for butanoic acid. I still had it highlighted from the last lecture. Perfect. So, oh, give it a second, yep. So my pKa that I look up for butanoic acid is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 5. So I can go back and fill that in. All right, and then how do I get these expressions right here? In order to get those, I'm going to have to uh, create my ice table. All right, so here's my ice table here, and I'm going to just fill these in. 
with the starting concentration of my acid, which is the 0 0.350 molar. I can even put my units to be good. And I have zero concentration of each of my products. The change that's observed is that I'm going to decrease in my concentration of acid, right? My products are going to be, oh, I'm sorry, my reactants are going to be consumed in this reaction. And I'm going to have my two products being generated. Uh, remember that these are all the same value of X because every single molecule of acid gets converted into a molecule of conjugate base and a molecule of hydronium. All right. So that's why when this decreases by a value of X, these increase by that same value. All right. Let me get rid of my little checking marks here. All right. So now for my equilibrium, my E, I'm just going to sum up everything in each of these first two columns. So this 0 0.350 minus X, X, X. And then I'm going to substitute these all into my expression, right? So this was my acid at equilibrium. So that's going to go here. This was my hydronium at equilibrium. So that's going to go there. And this was the conjugate base at equilibrium. So that's going to go there, right? That's why we create our ice table. So we know what to plug in to our Ka expression. All right, so let me just take this. I'm going to replace these first two with x times x. And actually, I can already see I'm going to need a little bit more room. So let me move this stuff up. All right, so my hydronium concentration, that was X. Conjugate base, that was X. So that's how I get X squared on top, right? X times X is X squared. And then down here, I'm going to plug in that 0 0.350 minus X. And that is equal to my Ka. But then I'm going to use this assumption where this value of x is so tiny that 0.35 minus x uh, is basically just 0.35. All right, so then I solve this for x and I get x equals 0 0.0022913. Um, you know, as I'd said in class, I don't really want you to focus too much on sig figs. What I will say is you don't want to round stuff in the middle of a problem ever, all right? Because that's definitely how you start to incur errors is if you round it every single step, right? So just get in the habit of copying down like six or seven digits, right? It'll make your math so much more accurate. If I was paying attention to sig figs here because I got two, that limits me here. And remember, one of the sticking points that I sort of warned you about was people forget what they're solving for. Right, so we got to remember we solve for this variable x, but what is x? Importantly, x is my hydronium ion concentration. All right, so if I'm looking for the pH, then I'm going to take that negative log of x, and that gives me my pH of 2.64, rounded to the correct number of sig figs, because remember, sig figs in our concentration will be decimal places in our pH. So that's the starting concentration of my solution. And again, what I wanted to hammer home to y'all is that this is exactly the same calculation that we learned how to do in chapter 17 for the concentration of a solution of weak acid. Okay, so what I'm going to do is sort of update some notes here. We said before the titrant was added, that's our first region. And we're going to just calculate pH of a solution of weak acid, just like we learned how to do in chapter 17. All right. So now we're going to do a region two calculation, right? So in this portion of my curve here, after I've started to add some of my titrant, notice that I, as I hope is intuitive, uh, I'm starting to add strong base, which is why my pH is starting to increase. But of course, we don't want to just know it increases. We want to know how much it increases, right? We want to do it quantitatively. So we're going to have to uh, learn how to do that. 
And what I will say is at this point, and from this point on, actually, because we have been adding this titrant, whoa, because we've been adding this titrant, we're changing the concentration of our solutions, right? We're adding more volume. So concentration is going to change, right? And again, we think about, it, I have this flask. As soon as I start adding solution to it, it actually doesn't even matter that it's base. If I was adding water to it, just by virtue of changing its volume, I'm changing its concentration. What I don't do is change the number of moles of acid that I have. And that's why for these calculations here, when we do our ice table, we have to do our ice table in moles when we're accounting for how much reaction occurs. Okay, so uh, look at this one here. For now, we're going to calculate the pH of the solution after 12 and a half milliliters of 0 0.48 molar potassium hydroxide has been added to the solution. All right, and again, we're uh, going to have to do our ice table in moles. And so the first step that we're going to do, and actually this is going to be the same first step for each of these uh, last three problems here, is we got to account for how much of this reaction has occurred, how much strong base has reacted with our weak acid. All right. So first of all, let's make sure that we can predict the products of this acid base reaction. All right. Now I don't just have my acid reacting with water. I have it reacting with this strong base, potassium hydroxide. So the proton from my acid is going to combine with the hydroxide ion from my uh, base to form water. I'm going to put it over here. I'll show you why in a second. <clears throat> Which means that my other two ions are also going to join up. I'm going to have my conjugate base pairing up with this potassium ion. So I get K. C4H7O2. Okay. Now, I, I just want to point something out. Um, a lot of people, I think, get confused by what the heck this thing is right here. All right. All this is is my conjugate base, just like if we had um, sort of when we did our reaction with water, we said that it was C4H7O2 minus. But then my Conjugate acid over here is this potassium ion, right? And so this positive charged ion over here is going to join up with that negative ion over there. That's why I write it as my, as I had previously, as potassium and then that C4H7O2. Okay. All right, let me get rid of some of this coloring just so we don't get too confused by what's going on here. All right. And actually, before I get going here, I'm going to stress a certain point, which is we're going to go through and label everything in this balanced chemical equation as being either strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, or neutral, right? Because we want to figure out what it's actually doing to our pH. So this first one here, the butanoic acid, that is a weak acid. How could I possibly know that this was a weak acid? Well, it's not on that short list of strong acids that we learned, right? So if I'm just going to sort of be good about doing some review here, remember we said that we had this short list of strong acids, including HCl, HBr, HI, nitric acid, HNO3, for chloric acid, HClO4, and then sulfuric acid, H2SO4. If you're not on that list, you're a weak acid. You know what else is a really good indication that this is a weak acid? Well, so first of all, because its name is butanoic acid, so that's a good indication. But not only that, but it's listed here on my table of weak acids, right? So all these factors combined should hopefully be able to sort of clue you in on the fact that this is indeed a weak acid. The only thing listed here are weak acids. Um, okay, so those are my strong acids. Let me just, because I'm going to want that space a little bit later. And what about KOH? Strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base, or neutral? Potassium hydroxide is a strong base. How do I know that? 
because anything with those OHs are strong bases. Okay. And now what about water? Hopefully we all know that water is not an acid or a base. It is neutral. All right. And then importantly, what about this thing here? Okay. And this is one other point, that, point that's really important to stress. Let's say that I make a list of acids and their conjugate bases. A strong acid, so for example, HCl, its conjugate base, the chloride ion, is going to be neutral. Okay, uh, another strong acid, HNO3, its conjugate base, the nitrate ion, also going to be neutral, right? So the conjugate base of strong acids is always neutral. But if I take a weak acid, so for example, my butanoic acid, its conjugate base, C4H7O2 minus, is going to be a weak base, all right? Uh, I mean, the same is true for any of these weak acids on our table. Acetic acid is a really common acid. So HC2H3O2, that's a weak acid. Well, its conjugate base, what we call the acetate ion, is a weak base, okay? And the same is true if I made a list, if I extended this list to then include, you know, bases and their conjugate acids, acids, sorry. A strong base, like, um, let's just do the one we're working with, potassium hydroxide. This is strong. Its conjugate acid, the potassium ion, is going to be neutral. But if I take a weak base, something like ammonia, which is weak, its conjugate acid, the ammonium ion, is a weak acid. All right, so strong always has a neutral conjugate, whereas weak, always has a weak conjugate, all right? And that's an important point to kind of understand here because this is really what's gonna make this weak acid, weak uh, strong base titration different than a strong acid, strong base titration, which is that one of my products that are produced is a weak base because it's the conjugate of my weak acid, okay? And because water's neutral, I don't actually have to worry about it to keep track of how much is made. I mean, I could, but I don't have to because it's not gonna contribute to the overall pH, which is the whole point of this problem. All right, so I'm actually gonna get rid of this column here just so I have some room to make some notes. All right, so now we're gonna start filling in our ice table. Again, we have to start with the initial amount of each of these, but we're gonna do it in moles, okay? So for my initial amount of acid, I have 35.00 milliliters times this 0 0.350 moles per liter, right? That's what that big M means. And so when I do this, I find that I get 12.25 millimoles of acid to start out with. If I was being good about my sig figs, I'm gonna keep that marked. Notice how with sig figs, I'm not gonna round yet because I'm not done with my problem. I'm just gonna keep track of it with the bar. For the amount of base that I start out with, that's 12.50 milliliters times my 0 0.480 moles over liters, leaving me with 6.00 millimoles. And but um, you know, right when I combine these things, before any reactions happened, I don't have any conjugate base. All right. Now, in order to figure out how much reaction has actually occurred, there's one important operating prin principle that we need to understand. 
And that is that all strong will react. Meaning that all of my strong base is going to react with my weak acid. So I'm going to get rid of all six millimoles of this strong base. And importantly, because this reaction is one to one, right? One to one chemical reaction. What that means is that one mole or one molecule of base will react with one molecule of acid. Right, I can't have more acid reacting than I have base reacting. They're one to one. So this is also going to decrease by that 6.00 millimole. And importantly, these two values are always going to be the same. There's no way for me to have more base reacting with acid uh, or more acid reacting than base. It just doesn't, it doesn't work like that. This reaction is one to one. And so now I got to figure out this box here. And importantly, if my reactants are going down, that means my products are going to be going up by that same amount. So if I finish this off by summing up those first two rows, I get 6.25 millimoles of my, con of my weak acid. I have zero strong base, and I have 6.00 millimoles of my weak base, my conjugate base. All right, so now I've done the first part here, right? Notice that for this second step, I had to break it up into two parts. One, account for how much reaction has occurred. And now two, calculate the pH of the solution that's left over after the reactions occurred. All right, for this here, I could do it the long way where I consider the reaction between this weak acid and water, considering I started out with an initial concentration of weak base. You can always do an ice table, but I can make one sort of observation that's going to make my life way easier. And that is to notice that this solution that I'm calculating the pH of is a combination of weak acid and its conjugate base, which we have a very special name for. This is a buffered solution. So when I calculate the pH for this region, I'm going to consider the fact that it's a buffered solution, which means that I get to use Henderson Hasselbach equation. Hasselbach. All right, so Henderson Hasselbach equation is that the pH equals the pKa <clears throat> plus the log of the concentration of base over the concentration of acid. So then to plug in what I have here, this pKa would be the negative log of that Ka, that 1.5 times 10 to the negative 5, plus the log. And so now I have to do my concentration of base divided by my concentration of acid. And what I found out, <clears throat> what I found from my ice table wasn't concentration, but moles. And remember constant, or in this case, millimoles. Remember concentration is gonna be moles per liter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my 6.00 millimoles of base, and I'm going to divide it by the total volume of this solution. And now what is the total volume of this solution? It's the 35 milliliters of acid that I started with plus the 12.5 milliliters of base that have been added, right? That's my new volume total, this 47.5 milliliters. All right, and I know I said concentrations moles per liter, but if I do millimoles divided by milliliters, the milli part will cancel out, leaving me with moles per liter. All right, so then for the concentration of acid, it's similar. It's going to be the 6.25 millimoles of acid divided by my total volume, the 47.50 milliliters. Again, that's my new total volume. So I can plug this in and I would get that my new pH of my solution after this titration has occurred. I'm going to round it to two sig figs because of this. This guy right here is my limiting. Would be four 
0.81. That's my pH at this portion of my titration. All right, and one thing I, you can kind of sort of notice that can save you a little bit of time. I don't want to get too bogged down on it um, if it's confusing to anybody. But if I look at just what's going on in this parentheses here, I'm dividing by 47.5 up here, but also down here. So they actually cancel out. So I could have just plugged in my, my moles. I was good about doing it because it was concentration, but the volume's the same. All right, and if that's more confusing than it's worth, don't worry about it. Just, just do it, plug in the concentrations, right? So that's solution two, so our um, region two. So let's just make note about what we had to do to calculate the pH at region two. So first question we had to ask was how much acid base reaction occurred. That was our first calculation that we did. And then we calculated the pH of the remaining solution. And what I mean by remaining solution is, you know, at the end of this acid base reaction, I had this weak acid mixed with its conjugate base, right? That was the solution that I had at the end. And because I was in this particular region, because I had that mixture of weak acid and its conjugate base, this had this sort of simplifying thing. And let me just make some more room for myself. Of the remaining solution, it's a buffered solution. So that allowed me to use Henderson Hasselbach just kind of made my math life a little bit easier. All right, so now we're gonna uh, calculate the pH at the equivalence point. And actually, let me real quick, let me just annotate this thing right here. So this region here, region two, again, let's just note this portion of my graph here, I got to use Henderson Hasselbach because this is a buffered solution. All right, so now I'm at my equivalence point. Oops. So calculate the pH at the equivalence point. So how am I going to do that? Well, so first of all, as we said before, our initial concentration of acid was this 35.00 milliliters times the three, uh, rather the 0.350. This over. Point three five zero moles per liter, giving me 12.25 millimoles of acid. So what does it mean to be the equivalence point? It means that the amount of acid that I have is equal to the amount of base that I have, right? It's equivalent. So that means that I have 12.25 millimoles of base at the equivalence point. Okay. Now, importantly, what I'm going to do is also figure out the volume of base added, right? I know how many moles of base are there, but if we think back to our titration here, sorry, All right, my equivalence point is when I have exactly as much acid as I do base in this little flask, but how much did I add from my burette? How much volume-wise did I add? All right, and this is going to be important. We're going to need that information in order to finish off the problem. So I need to know what volume I had of my 0 0.480 moles per liter solution. All right, and so working backwards, I can find that this has to be 12, um, no, no, it doesn't, 25.52 milliliters of base that would get me my 12.25 millimoles of base, all right? And again, in my math here, I'm sort of accounting for the, or I'm sort of saying that no reactions happened yet. I'm gonna figure out how much has. So I don't have any of this conjugate base to start out with. All right, so now what's the change here? How much reaction has occurred? Same operating principle. 
all strong reacts. So that means all 12.25 millimoles of base will react. I have the same number of millimoles of acid. Remember, we said that these have to be the same. And that means that my conjugate base is going to increase by that same concentration. Not concentration, sorry. Same number of moles. So at my equivalence point, I have zero moles of starting acid. I have zero moles of strong base. The only thing I have is 12.25 millimoles of my conjugate base. Well, remember, we said that this conjugate base was a weak base. So at the equivalence point, what I have in terms of how I'm going to consider calculating my pH is just a solution of weak base. Again, this is from chapter 17. How do we calculate the pH of a solution of weak base? Right. So before we can actually sort of get started, we do need to know what the concentration of that weak base is. I know that concentration is moles divided by liters or millimoles divided by milliliters. And in order to get the milliliters of my base here or of my um, solution, I have to take my starting amount of acid and add in the amount of base that I titrated in, right? So that's why we had to calculate that value up there. And this would get me 60.52 milliliters, giving me an overall concentration of weak base of 0 0.2024096. 4096. Again, I'm just going to take a bunch of digits. I'll keep my sig fig marked, but I don't want to round it off because that would be a rounding error. All right, so now I'm just going to calculate the pH of a solution of a weak base, just like we did in chapter 17, given that the concentration is this two, uh, 0.2024, whatever, whatever. All right, so actually I'm going to need some more room, so I'm going to take this to a new page. All right, and now it's going to look surprisingly similar to what we did in part one. We're going to get a balanced chemical equation. And again, I'm calculating the pH of a solution of weak base. All right, so I'm going to consider the reaction between my weak base, C4H7O2 minus, and water which because it's a weak base, it's not going to create hydronium ions. It's going to create hydroxide ions and it's conjugate acid. I'm going to do my equilibrium expression only because this is a base and not an acid. My equilibrium expression isn't going to be a Ka. It's going to be a Kb. So that's the next step, Kb expression. Concentration of hydroxide ions times the concentration of my conjugate acid. Okay. And then in order to fill in this equilibrium expression, I'm again going to make an ice table. So I change equilibrium. And my initial concentration is going to be what I calculated here, this 0.2024096. Molar, and I have zero product at this point. My change, my base concentration is going to go down, and my two products are going to increase. And that's how I get my equilibrium value of 
202-4096 minus x plus x plus x. Again, let me just make some room because I'm running out. And we're going to fill these in for our KB. KB equals x squared over that 0 0.2024096 minus x. I'm going to assume that x is so small that this is just going to be the same thing as that 0 0.02024. Uh, 0 All right. And now how do we get our KB? Uh, if I go to my table here, I'm definitely not going to be able to find butanoic acid on my KB table here because it's not really a base. It's the conjugate base of a weak acid, right? We found the acid form on this table here. So how do I get my KB? I have to remember that the KA of an acid times the KB of its conjugate base is always equal to 10 to the negative 14, right? So that's how I'm going to figure out my KB. I'm going to take 10 to the negative 14 and divide it by that KA, which was 1.5 times 10 to the negative 5. All right, and let me just kind of scrunch this up so I have a little bit more room to work with. So when I solve, I get X equals, and I'm gonna put it in scientific notation here, 1.16164 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, if I'm being good about sig figs, now I only have two because my KA limited me. But now again, this is where it's sort of important not to get tripped up. We gotta remember what X is. X is the concentration of hydroxide ions. Whoops. So if I take the negative log of X, I'm going to have the pOH. So I'm going to have to do 14 in order to get the pH. I'm going to do 14 minus that negative log of X. And that's how I get a pH of four point, uh, not four, sorry, 9.0, rounded to the correct number of sig figs, two decimal places, 9.07. All right, so that does it for my pH at my equivalence point. <clears throat> We're gonna just update my sort of list here. How do we do this calculation? At the equivalence point, we have that moles of acid, let's say even, let's even be more specific, moles of my weak acid equal moles of weak, nope, moles of strong base, right? All of that gets consumed. And so then that also equals the moles of my conjugate base that have been consumed or produced. Holy shit. Ah. Uh, all right. So at the equivalence point, we have that the moles of my weak acid equal the moles of my strong base. Right. And so all of that strong base reacts with that weak acid. And so that actually creates the same number of moles of my conjugate base. Right. And then I had to get the concentration of that conjugate base by taking moles of conjugate base and dividing by that total volume. And then from there, in order to calculate the pH, I just treated this as a solution.
of my weak base, calculating the pH the same way we did in chapter 17. All right, and then so our last portion here is how to calculate the pH after the equivalence point, right? So we got, whoa, hold up. We got these regions here all down. The beginning, this buffered region at the equivalence point. The only thing we have left is this portion up here. So let's tackle that. I can already see them. I need to make a little bit more room. So just... Okay. All right, so now our last one is calculate the pH after a total of 30 milliliters of my potassium hydroxide has been added. So again, we're going to have to do it in moles to account for how much reaction has occurred. 35.00 milliliters times the 0 0.350 moles per liter gives me that 12.25 millimoles of acid. Now I have 30 milliliters of base times that 0 0.480 moles per liter, giving me a total of, let me do it. Fourteen point four millimoles of base. I got zero conjugate base to start out with. All right. Now again, how do we figure out the change? We got the same operating principle that all strong will react. The problem is, is that I can't say minus fourteen point four because these both have to be the same number, right? And I can't have a negative number of whatever it would be, negative two, whatever, number of, I guess it wouldn't be two, negative one, whatever it is. I can't have a negative number of moles, bottom line, right? So I just don't have enough acid to react with all 14.4 millimoles of base. So even though all of my base will react, it's limited by how much acid I have such that only this 12.25 millimoles of base can react. So plus 12.25. All right, so. So I got no weak acid left over. I got 2.15 millimoles of strong base left over, and I have 12.25 millimoles of weak base left over. All right, so check, check. We've accounted for how much of this reaction has actually occurred. Now, in order to calculate the pH, how are we going to approach this, right? So this was kind of the portion that's been different for each region. How do we go about uh, calculating the pH? I have this solution that's a mixture of strong base and weak base, okay? And what's important to remember is that our weak bases, they don't really dissociate all that much, right? That's why we're always able to make that assumption that X is really small and drop it from our equation. So the contribution of my weak base to the, to the amount of hydroxide ions produced is gonna be very, very small. The vast majority of this pH change is going to come from this strong acid right here, which is why in region four, when we're calculating the pH, we're going to just assume we have only, and we'll even specify a solution of strong base. I'm not even going to consider these 12.25 millimoles of weak base in this calculation at all. The only thing I'm going to do is look at how much strong base I got, because that's really going to dictate what the pH of this solution is. All right. And remember, the nice thing about strong bases is that I get to assume that my concentration of strong base that I have initially 
is equal to the concentration of hydroxide ions at equilibrium. So all I really need to do is figure out how much KOH I have, right? But I need it in concentration. So I'm going to have to take my millimoles of base, that 2.15, and divide it by the total volume, which is going to be the 35 milliliters of acid plus the 30 milliliters of base. So 65.00 milliliters will give me a concentration of hydroxide ions of this solution equal to 0.0330769. Molar. I was being good about sig figs. I should have three of them. I should actually only have two because this number is two. Don't get bogged down in sig figs. Follow the process. Okay, so then I can take the negative log of this, but that would be, of course, the pOH would be the negative log of the concentration of hydroxide ions. So then I'm going to do the pH, which is 14 minus my pOH, or plus the log of the concentration of hydroxide ions. And so when I finally calculate my pH to the correct number of sig figs, this would be 12.52. Okay, so for this particular region, again, we have like a slightly different approach, a slightly different strategy for each region on my pH curve here. After the equivalence point, we see that all weak acid is reacted and there's an excess of strong base. All right, so really all we have to do is calculate the concentration of that strong base. And then calculate the pH of a solution of, let me move my four here, strong base, just like we learned how to do in chapter 17. All right. So we have a different strategy in terms of how we approach each of these problems. This is region four here. Um, the first one is literally nothing special, nothing different at all. We're just calculating the pH of a solution of weak acid, right? From there on out, we've started adding base. We have to account for how much reaction has occurred. In the second region, once we've accounted for how much reaction has occurred, we actually see that we have a buffer solution. So we can use Henderson-Hasselbach to figure out what the pH is. In the third region, or rather just at that one point, that equivalence point, after we calculate how much reaction has occurred, we see that all we have left over is conjugate base. So once we calculate the P, uh, not the pH, once we calculate the concentration of conjugate base, then we just treat it as a solution of weak base and calculate the concentration. And then after the equivalence point, we again have to account for how much reaction has occurred. But after all reaction has occurred, we're left over with actually a mixture of weak base and strong base, but we're gonna ignore the weak base part. And so we're gonna treat it as if we have a solution of strong base, and we're gonna calculate the pH of that strong base solution, just like we learned how to do in chapter 17, all right? So hopefully this uh, sort of video has helped you guys sort of go through these problems. Um, again, there's a worksheet on Canvas with basically this exact same problem that I want you to go through and make sure you understand how to do, all right? There's another one, which is a weak base strong acid titration, which is going to be a little different, but not really, right? All you got to do is follow these same principles. I believe in y'all. All right. Um, good luck this weekend and please uh, doing these weird worksheets and please let me know if you guys need any help.